I'll be speaking about how the gospel will spread to the ends of the earth through people who are submitted to the Holy Spirit. Um, online, you can find many videos of the world's major cities without a single person anywhere to be seen. Cities which are known for bustling with activity and never sleeping. And they've been captured on video with no one in sight as far as the eye can see. These videos were all recorded during the COVID-19 pandemic and demonstrate how a tiny little microscopic virus had an impact on just about every human being on the face of the planet. Well, when God sent his Holy Spirit, there was much more of an impact and the global implications are much more important. Are we a people that resist the Holy Spirit or are we a people that are submitted to him? A word of prayer before we dive in. Dear Lord God, would it be the story of our lives that uh, where you go, we'll go, where you lead, we will follow. Lord God, would it be our heart's desire to be fully yielded, to be completely submitted to your will. That as the word says, um, since we live by faith, that we would walk in, since we live by the Spirit, that we would walk in step with the Spirit, Lord God. And I thank you for the scripture, the passage that we have before us this morning. Lord God, I pray that I would be nothing, that you would be everything. I pray that... Um, yeah, that we would have ears to hear and hearts to receive what your spirit would have us hear from your word this, this morning and that it would bear much good fruit to the praise of your great and glorious name. Amen. We're in chapter 13 of the book of Acts and I'll read the first passage and we'll look through it. And then I'll share some closing thoughts from the second part of the passage before us this morning. So, Acts chapter 13 from verse 44. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you, since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing, and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing, and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Bar Barnabas, and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them, and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Luke states, right in the beginning of the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 1, that his first book, the Gospel according to Luke, deals with all that Jesus began to do and to teach. This implies that Acts, which is the sequel to Luke's Gospel, deals with the things that Jesus went on to do and to teach. So primarily through the work of the Holy Spirit. I think the series that you're working through in the book of Acts is very aptly titled, The Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because he is the one who is in focus all throughout the book. The key verse of the book, Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, is this. But you will receive 
power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. It's often the case that Luke's descri- Luke describes the actions of the book's characters in relation to the Holy Spirit. So this is not an exhaustive list, but here are some examples. Um, at Pentecost in ch- chapter 2 of the book of Acts, Jesus' followers were filled with the Holy Spirit and proclaimed God's mighty works in many languages. In chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira lied to the Holy Spirit and they agreed to test him. In numerous, passage, in numerous passages, the Holy Spirit is given to all those who believe in the gospel. And in chapter 5, Stephen preached in the power of the Spirit about the fact that the Jewish people have always resisted the Holy Spirit. So there are only two options. Either we resist the Holy Spirit or we submit to him. And this morning, we'll be looking at the contrast between those who reject or resist the Holy Spirit and those who yield or submit to him. Verse 44. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the, Jew, when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul. So... Sorry, just a bit more context. At the start of chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas are commissioned for ministry, and they embark on their first ministry journey. And along the way, they reach Pisidian Antioch, which is where this is taking place. And last week, you will have looked at how they preached the gospel at one of the synagogues there. They shared the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there was a lot of interest and eagerness to hear more from them the following week, which brings us to verse 44 and verse 45. So this response where the Jews are filled with jealousy and start contradicting Paul, reviling him, um, brings us to the first point of what it looks like to resist the Holy Spirit, and that's that those who resist the Holy Spirit are filled with something else, something other than the Holy Spirit. When it says in verse 45 that the Jews were filled with jealousy, I think it's it's right for us to assume that there was no space for them to be filled with God's Spirit. (coughs) Galatians 6 and verse 8 reads, Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. The Spirit and the flesh are at odds with one another. If we, le- if, if we live to satisfy our flesh, then we can be assured that we are not walking in accordance with the Holy Spirit. If you're not full of the Spirit, you best be sure that you're full of something else. And oftentimes I think it means you're full of yourself. Moving on then, we see how those who resist the Holy Spirit reject the word of God. So towards the end of verse 45, it says, they began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, (coughs) reviling him. So these same Jews had shown interest in the gospel just a few verses earlier, a week before these events. But now they were firmly opposing God's word. They may have liked some aspects of the message, but disliked the fact that the Gentiles were being offered the same hope. We've just come from our church family camp, and the meals were served buffet style. Um, So my sister-in-law was here visiting from Germany, and she filled her plate with vegetables. And I was eating a pile of meat. (laughs) Um, God's word is not buffet style. We don't get to pick and choose parts of it. We are called to obey and submit to the whole counsel of God. 
And we can contradict God's word by doing what we shouldn't do or by neglecting to do what we should. And so how are we loving our neighbors or spreading the gospel? How are we spending our time and our treasure and our talents? Another way, sorry, so thirdly, um, those who resist the Holy Spirit exclude themselves from eternal life. In verse 46, and Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. <laughs> Rejecting God's word is a rejection of the offer of eternal life. And the alternative is to have the enemy who comes to steal and to kill and to destroy, to have him lead you. And in doing so, you reject the life which is truly life that Christ came to offer to all who would believe. Eternal life is knowing God and being known by him. It's getting to see and savor his glory and goodness forever. And the alternative is a great and disastrous judgment. Resisting the Holy Spirit leads to missing out on the blessings of participating in God's salvation plan. So in verse 47... There is a quote from the prophet Isaiah. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And yet to those who would resist the Holy Spirit, there's no role for them to play. They are not sharing in the joy of spreading the great and glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ of drawing, helping to draw souls from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's marvelous light. So those who resist the Holy Spirit are filled with something else. They reject the word of God. They exclude themselves from eternal life. And they miss out on the blessing of participating in God's salvation plan. By contrast, what does this passage have to say about those who do submit to the Holy Spirit? Verse 48, And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. So here we see, first of all, that those who submit to the Holy Spirit have reason to rejoice. Psalm 67 is a psalm which, sorry, excuse me. Psalm 67 is a psalm which foresees the fulfillment of the Great Commission. Um, to have disciples made of all nations. And it looks at how the gospel impact, how the gospel will impact all people groups through to the ends of the earth. I'll read a few verses from, from the psalm. May God be gracious to us and bless us. And make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy 
For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon earth. Submission to the Holy Spirit awakens joy. It is a joy which persists despite persecution and suffering and hardship. It is a joy which will be made complete when Christ returns. And because of this sure hope, we have reason to rejoice in the Lord always. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Those who submit to the Holy Spirit glorify God's word. So again in verse 48, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. They elevated it to its rightful position. They study it. They meditate on it. They live by it. God's word, more than anything else, shapes their worldview. Those who submit to the Holy Spirit believe unto eternal life. Again in verse 48. Um, as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. Resist the Holy Spirit and you've rejected eternal life, that for which we were created to be in right relationship with God and one another in all creation. Um, and yet, submit to the Holy Spirit and you will lay hold of life which is truly life. Those who submit to the Holy Spirit spread God's word. Let's look together at verse 49. It says, And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. So we know that Paul and Barnabas were based at the synagogue. How then was the gospel spreading throughout the whole region? It had to be that those who believed in the word that Paul and Barnabas had preached were faithful to share it with others in the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever resisted a nudge from the Holy Spirit to share God's word with someone? I know that I have. And not out of guilt or obligation, but to share in the joy of leading others to the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, the gospel may be rejected. We may be persecuted. But obedience and faithfulness entail entrusting the results to the Holy Spirit while sharing boldly in the strength that he supplies. And as we talk about sharing the word, I like to, like to draw our attention back to that key verse within the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And you will receive the Holy Spirit and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so it's our immediate context and it's to the ends of the earth. Looking at verse 46, again, sorry, looking at verse 50. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and drove them out of their district. <clears throat> but they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Um, I've been thinking a lot about Paul's words regarding the rejection of the gospel and how he would turn to the Gentiles and this act of shaking their, shaking the dust off 
their feet against them as they depart for Iconium. And from what I can tell, Paul is not speaking about losing a concern for the salvation of the Jewish people. He's not speaking about them being written off in any way. In fact, the trend continues of him primarily reaching out in in the strategic locations along his missionary journeys of reaching out from the synagogue as the center. And so he continues to share with Jewish hearers. But when he speaks of turning to the Gentiles, it means a widening of his target audience to include the Gentiles, those who had been, had been excluded. And recognizing that God has always atten- intended for the gospel call to reach the ends of the earth. And we can, we can all have an impact within our immediate context and to the ends of the earth. I truly believe that. But how? We can't all pack up and go be missionaries, can we? (laughs) But there's a role for each of us to play. Um, I know Operation Mobilization, which is a missions organization, outlines three ways that people can be actively involved on a daily basis in reaching the ends of the earth. And one way is that we can be praying. We can be praying for the harvest which is ripe to be brought in, that workers will go out, that all provisions that they need will be provided by God and that their ministry would be effective as they reach out to the lost. And we can give financially to support those who, who engage in the work of, of taking the gospel to places where it's desperately needed. And we ourselves, as the Lord calls, may be called to go. And so in some way, shape, or form, on a daily basis, we can all participate in reaching the ends of the earth, as well as impacting our immediate context. Verse 52, and the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. So those who submit to the Holy Spirit are filled with joy and the Spirit. We've already touched on joy. All the peoples in all the earth have every reason to rejoice if they surrender to the one true Lord and King. Galatians 6 and verse 8 reads, Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. It's that same verse again. And yet just here reiterated that if we yield to the Spirit and His leading, it will lead to eternal life. He will fill us. He will be faithful to lead and guide us every single step of the way. Faithfulness to share God's Word despite mixed responses. It's not about what people group you belong to. It's not about ethnicity. It's about the gospel call of the Lord Jesus Christ, which goes out to the ends of the earth. Um, Joshua Project, which is an organization that keeps track of the numbers of people groups, say that over 7,000 people groups can be considered unreached with the hope of the gospel. We could be praying for the gospel to go go out. We could be giving towards the going out of the gospel. And we could be going ourselves in the power of the Spirit and as the Lord leads. The gospel will spread to the ends of the earth through people 
who submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Something very, very important that we, we should take away with us this morning is the question, how am I involved in the Great Commission? I think that was the thrust of the, the passage this morning, a, a very significant part of Acts because we're starting to see a response to what God was doing in those days. Um, and you can always tell a lot from the time of response. And as tonight brought out, there's, there's this mixed response, and the reason for it is spirit-filled versus flesh-filled. Filled with self or filled with God and His desire. But how am I involved in the Great Commission? I hope that you are pursuing an answer to that question. I hope that you have the inklings of an answer to that question. Um, I remember I used to follow uh, Joshua Project, or, um, Overland Mission, and, and various sites like those. That's, that's a way to get started and to start understanding what is the mission? What's the extent of the mission? What are we even trying to do? I mean, if you want to pray effectively, so how am I involved? If you want to pray effectively, friends, then you need to understand what is going on. What needs to happen in the soil? What needs to happen in this world? What is God's plan and purpose? If you want to provide appropriately, you also need to understand. So, are you praying? Are you providing? Are you on the journey to doing those, at least those things? And then I think the next uh, step, and something we do as the church, is to prioritize the Great Commission. Not just, you know, for it to be this, this side thing, or like an add-on that we, we do as the church. Not at all. That needs to be, that's our destination, friends. It should be the reason that we're coming together, so that we can go out. Um, and as the church prioritizes, so I, I know tonight I mentioned three things, but I think there is more than that. We also need to stir one another up to love and good works, right? So we need to focus one another on this purpose. So we need to pray, we need to provide, we need to preach in a way that sends people out from our context to their... Jerusalem, to their Judea, and then, Lord willing, to the ends of the earth. This church will not be a mature church until it sends missionaries to the end of the earth. But maybe we can do that in, way, in unexpected ways. Are we preaching about it? Are we prioritizing it? Pray, provide, preach, prioritize. How am I involved in the Great Commission? Thank you so much. Uh, for joining us this morning. It's so good to see uh, so many. Uh, during the holidays, often it's a much smaller, more intimate uh, service as we had a week ago, but this is, this is good, and it's a blessing. Uh, tune in for the service um, online next week, and let's meet again in, in two weeks to, to do the same. Um, to God's glory, shall we pray? Lord, we just lift you up. We lay our whole lives down, our whole lives down. Before the Lord. And Lord, let that be for a purpose. Lord, you have called us into this mission of yours, and I pray that we would all be missionaries in our way. And Lord, that if it is your will, that we would be willing, be equipped to be those who, who go to those peoples who don't yet know you. And Lord Jesus, you say that you will return in all creation, when all the earth, all peoples, have heard this gospel. So help us to hasten the day of your return by being intentional about missions, by being intentional about being a going church. We thank you that you meet our daily needs. May it all be for a purpose, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.